Can you wrap something like that? That's right. We supported a couple of missionaries uh, at the congregation Nick and I met at in Florida. Uh, missionaries in China. We call them missionaries, but they weren't allowed to preach. They were because they knew uh, Chinese. Um, they were translators, but you know they used their translation as a way of befriending people and maybe get a Bible study on the side, but as far as just openly proclaiming the gospel, they couldn't do that. Now, China's a big country. I don't know where they were at and whether it's that way everywhere, but I know that they were primarily teachers who would teach about Jesus if you let them, but they didn't openly confess it because they would have been in danger. Really? I didn't hear that. They're poor. Um, let me tell you. Since I've been on Facebook, which is what, 10 years now maybe, every Indian preacher that asks me to be his friend sends me an email five minutes later. How you doing, sir? Just as polite as can be. But you give him five minutes and they want it, they're asking for money. That's how poor they are. And I mean, these are legitimately good people. But, you know, because you've got so many, you know, no matter what country you're talking about, you're always going to have somebody that scams the system. And uh, it's kind of cold hearted to tell them you got to go through proper channels. You can't just reach out to individual preachers. We don't know you. You've got to have somebody that. In fact, while I was at school of preaching, we had stopped students from coming over from Haiti. Everybody knows how, pow how poor Haiti is. Unfortunately, there were students that were using the school of preaching as a way to get into the country. And, you know, didn't have any intention on preaching after they were done. And they just wanted to be American. It's kind of, you know, you could, you didn't know it at first, but, you know, as weeks and months dragged on, you could realize these guys aren't here for school. So eventually we, now I don't think that policy is, Lifelong policy has probably changed by now, but I know we had a problem with that for a little while. Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to the Highway 30 Church of Christ Bible class. We are studying Exodus. If you are online, thank you for joining us. Once again, I want to say thank you to everyone who helped out for Bring a Friend Day. I think it was an enjoyable experience for many people. Chabella, you're Parents were edified, I hope. Yes, they were. They said they were going to come back. We and I don't know, but 
I'm going to come down and talk to them. I will. I will. Um, yeah, they're wonderful people. Our guest was favorably impressed, too. She didn't say she'd come back, but we're working on her. Charles, so good to see Mary. But anyway, thank you for everybody at least attempted to uh, ask somebody. I know how difficult it can be in this world, so we appreciate it. But we did have a good time, and thank you once again, Nicole. Uh, lobby and the fellowship hall were beautiful. I took the little basket home to... Nicole, she wants to use that in the house. Five minutes after I set it down, one of our cats was already in it taking a nap. So, <laughs> But anyways, uh, <clears throat> appreciate that. Charles, we got upcoming event on the 7th, do we? That's the plan. Uh, I sent out the email. Hopefully everybody got it. Uh, oh, I didn't look today. We got a few games. Uh, we could play Bible trivia. I think we got a Bible trivia game. Yeah, air conditioned games. Yeah. I don't want to play Monopoly. I don't care who. Yeah. What's that? You got? Um, oh, you mean darts to those kind? I was thinking lawn darts. Do they even make lawn darts anymore? I just happened to see some the other day, and they had the. You know, round bottom that would lead so that they would guarantee to fall that way. Yeah. Need a helmet to go to bed anymore in this world. What happened to survival of the fittest? If you can't stay alive in a game of jarts, maybe you shouldn't have kids of your own. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But anyways, the, yeah, I, you know, yeah, they don't even make dart or jarts. Isn't that what they call them, jarts? I think that's what they call them. At least they did up in Michigan. But that was a fun game. But yeah, you got to use the lead weights now. But anyways, yeah, we got a couple of games, Charles. We can bring over indoor games. We'll bring them over. Which one of you gentlemen would like to get us started tonight? <coughs> Stanley, you look like you're working on one.
Chapter 15, I haven't quite knocked it out yet. Exodus 15. We just got done with the Song of Moses. As soon as they crossed the Red Sea, God commanded Moses to compose this song. The Jews would sing it on a particular Sabbath every year. I imagine they sang it more than that, but particularly on one Sabbath. And I'm guessing it was the Sabbath as close to this event as they could get. I think my favorite line in the song is verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song. What's a muse? It's an inspiration. It motivates you to want to write music in the first place. People usually need an inspiration. As Christians, our inspiration should be God and the wonderful good work he's done for us. But anyways, what a wonderful song it is. As we notice, Miriam, in verse 20, also chimed in. 
with singing and dancing. <clears throat> so let's pick it up in chapter 15, 22. So Mo Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Um, Shur means wall in the Hebrew. And apparently there's a place over there that uh, people who have traversed the land uh, you know, try to connect places, um, ge geography with what the Bible says. Apparently there's a place there that seems to be surrounded by a wall and so they're pretty confident they know where the wilderness of Shur is since it means wall. That's not positive, but it's, uh, <clears throat> scholars are pretty confident based on that. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Um, three jumps out at me. Why three? I'm sorry? Look at Betty. Gold star to Betty. She already knows where I'm coming from. Yeah, um, three. How many, you know, it's amazing how often three is a time of trouble in the Bible which is why it became um, symbolic of trouble. You know, I don't know if this is true. I just heard a commercial the other day that said, uh, what's her name? Taylor Swift. I, could, I wouldn't recognize one song by Taylor Swift if I heard it on the radio. That's how out of the loop I am. You know, like six months ago, she had top 10 songs in America. All 10. I mean, Beatles and Elvis didn't do that. But anyways, <laughs> um, apparently her lucky, according to the commercial, her lucky number is 13. Uh, you know, I don't know anything about Taylor Swift, but I already like her if that's her lucky number. <laughs> What's your lucky number? 13, why not? But it, the reason why I bring up 13 is 13, you know, to me, well, I shouldn't say it that way, but Americans don't put nearly as much symbolic uh, symbolism into our numbers. 13, ooh, it's a bad sign. Friday the 13th, everybody stay at home. Um, you know, we do have, a, there is some numbers that have symbolism, uh, but not many. But the Jews had symbolism for just about every number. There's an awful lot of symbolism with the Jews. Number three, half of seven, tended to be a sign of trouble. How long was Jesus in the grave? Um, yeah, yeah I, you can go over, you know, there's many times in the Bible where that's the idea. Daniel chapter 8, I'm not going to make a turn now, I'll just tell you about it, but Daniel chapter 8, he has another one of his visions, and um, he sees actually the period between the Testaments. Malachi was written 400 B.C., John the Baptist didn't come for another 400 years. We call that the <coughs> silent period where there were no prophets. And there's no writings about that period. But that's only partially true. Because Daniel prophesied about that period. Uh, he prophesied about the Seleucid dynasty. He prophesied about the Ptolemies. When Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided four ways. It took about 20 years for that to happen but his kingdom was divided four ways. And the Seleucid dynasty took over in Syria, they had that part of the world. And then the Ptolemies took over in Egypt, they had that part of the world. And of course, what lies right in between Syria and Egypt? Promised land. Well, a king arose in um, Syria named Antiochus Epiphanes, I believe it was the third. But anyways, what's Epiphany mean? manifestation of God. He claimed to be a manifestation of God. But he came in and desolated the temple, offered a swine on the altar just to insult the Jews and then shut the temple down. Guess how long he shut the temple down for? Three years. Well, yeah, it's a great guess, but it was three years. Um, the passage actually says 2,300 mornings and evenings, or 2,300 days, it actually says. If we were studying it, I'd point that out to you. But anyways, it turns out to be three years. 
Jesus was in the grave for three years. How long did the Jews persecute the Christians right after Christianity was born in Acts chapter 2? Let me ask you a different way. When was Jerusalem destroyed? 87. Well, if the church started in 33, 43, 53, 63, what do you know? Three and a half. When did Rome make Christianity a state religion? Or at least make it a legal religion? It didn't become the state religion until later, but 313. 123. Time of trouble. You'd be amazed at how often 3 stands for trouble in the Bible. So it um, <clears throat> doesn't surprise me to see that uh, they were without water and tempted here in the wilderness for 3 days. But 3 becomes very symbolic of trouble. Yes, Sam. It's all right. Go ahead. Trinity as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, depending on how you're using it. But anyway, the Jews had all kinds of symbolism for numbers. What do you think the symbolism for four was? It's the world. North, south, east, west. Four corners of the earth. Book of Revelation, you see the four angels uh, on the other side of the river. And don't let trouble loose until God gives the command. But anyways, that kind of thing. No, uh, numbers, very symbolic to the Jews. There also was a, it's called the Sibylline Oracle that described Jesus with the number 888. Which, by the way, is why some people think 666 does not represent anyone in particular. There are basically two schools of thought that that I think are acceptable as far as some ideas are just wrong. These are two schools that I wouldn't say you're wrong um, because scholars look at it either way. Some people think 666 just represents people who don't measure up. If seven is the perfect number, six falls below. And so it represents basically all of the Roman kings, or emperors I should say, because they were worldly men as opposed to godly men. I'll get you right after I answer my own question here, Betty. Well, if 666 represents not measuring up, why would Jesus be described as 888? Because if, three, if 7 is perfection and 3 is the number of God, 777 seven, seven would be perfection. Jesus is beyond perfection. That's the way some people viewed that. Betty, what was your question? Yes. Uh huh. Um, and the Trinity is three, not two and a half or three. So is there a separation of the three and a half negative and the three is positive? Or am I just totally. No, it's a good question, and I can't answer it. For certainty, but I would say off the top of my head, best answer I got off the top of my head is context. If you're reading the context, what's the context tell you? Context tells you we're talking about trouble. Because three and a half and three, I'm glad Betty brought that up. Sometimes you see it both ways. For instance, what did Daniel mean when he said time, times, and half time? Revelation says the same thing. What does that mean? It's three and a half. Time times half time. Three and a half. Which is why, um, well, never mind. But anyways, yeah, um, time times and half time. I was about to say something I wasn't sure of myself, but I didn't want to have to repent of my own words. <laughs> anyways, three days. Uh, so here's God is testing them once again, you know, considering everything that's just happened, you would think that they would be full of faith. But unfortunately, verse 23, now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara, which means bitter. And apparently, there's body water over there in the general area that has the same problem these days. It's very brackish water that people will not drink unless they're extremely parched. 
depending on how much rainfall they get during the course of the year, determines whether it's more drinkable or less drinkable. <clears throat> but there's still a body of water that uh, probably represents where Mara was in these days. Verse 24, and the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. So I'm guessing the he is not Moses, but God. And I don't know exactly what the statute or the ordinance was, but I imagine it had something to do with uh, them being grateful that <clears throat> once again, God had come to their rescue. Why would you doubt at this point? But notice this is the third time um, that the Jews in the wilderness are murmuring against Moses and against God. And said, verse 26, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. And they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. That's a um, helpful verse when it comes to who wrote the book of Exodus? Um, particularly if you're like watching the History Channel. Before I became a Christian, every now and then I would turn on ancient Bible mysteries or whatever. Um, and I still do once in a while, but not so much anymore because I get infuriated when I turn on the um, those channels because of how liberal the scholarship is that they always rely on on channels like that. But, uh, once again, beware if you're listening to programs like that because you may hear somebody act like Moses didn't write the first five books of the Old Testament. <clears throat> it's called the Documentary Hypothesis Theory. It came into play right after evolution came into play. A guy by the name of Julius Wellhausen went through the Bible and pretty much did what the Bible, what evolution teaches, which is that the Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament, weren't written by Moses. They were written over time by many Jews. Started with a couple of documents that they can't even name. That's how bad the theory is. You know, if you guys think that Jewish scholars, you know, rabbis were you know, pilfering documents or at least using documents, where are the documents? They just act like they existed even though they can't prove it. It's what we call an assertion. Um, but anyways, then they claim those documents were built on over time and that the first time the law was actually uttered was in the days of Nehemiah. Um, so if you're watching programs like that or reading something, you might want to be careful because there are people uh, that insist Moses did not write uh, the first five books. He didn't have anything to do with it. Why is the last verse in that chapter helpful? Yeah. Yeah, I was actually going to, I was going to make the point on the last verse there, but I was going to go back to that. I love the way Wilbur, the one of the scholars I'm reading for it, says mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it's kind of uncanny that, you know, 
Um, brackish waters were made sweet by a tree. Waters of life represent uh, the word of God. And isn't it interesting that a tree made the water sweet? And as Charles just pointed out, next time we need water, where's it going to come from? It come from a rock. You almost can't miss it, can you? But I like the way Wilbur said it. He said, it makes a wonderful illustration, but allows the exegesis. <laughs> His point being, it's not in the text, but knowing as we do, you know, Christ and his work on the cross and, and the river of life, uh, or, you know, Jesus being the water of life. Yeah, the, um, the uh, imagery can't, is hard to miss. Although, as I said, or as Wilbur said, you know, it's not really in the text, but it's hard not to make that connection. So I agree with Charles. But the reason why verse 27 gets my attention where I was going with that is, is or, yeah, 27. Does that not sound like an eyewitness writing in that? You're writing 100 years later. You're going to tell us how many, I say 100. If you're writing 500 years later, are you going to notice that there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees? That sounds like somebody who's there on the scene. Counting the number of palm trees, counting the number of wells. Moses, he was there. He was alive. He was writing. Um, it wasn't some scholar that came along five, six, eight hundred years later that wrote that. Uh, one of the things that's very frustrating about those same kind of programs and liberal scholars in general is just how little of the Bible they actually believe. And particularly anything that's got to do with the incredible, they just seem to want to reject. But anyways, yeah. Um, whoever wrote verse 27, and of course it was Moses, sure seemed like he was there. Counting the wells and counting the palm trees. Again, I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, but uh, one of the pieces of evidence to me that gives me confidence to read in the Bible is just how it rings true. You know, obviously, that you know, if you're a lawyer and you're wanting to prove your case, that's not the argument you want to take into a court of law. But the Bible rings true over and over again. First thing that happens when they get done singing, well, why did they sing? Because they were just relieved of bondage for, after 430 years. Busted out and sung. But they're in the wilderness. What do they next encounter? The thirsty. What do they next encounter? They're hungry. And then they will be thirsty again in chapter 17. So it just rings true. That's exactly what you would expect to happen. As people would get thirsty, as people would get hungry. You got your hand up, Betty, or are you just holding it like that? Okay. Gotcha. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, which does not mean what we think sin means. We really do not know exactly what the word means, but that's not what it means. Same as uh, evil Merodach. I think that was Nebuchadnezzar's son. It doesn't mean his name was Merodach and he was evil. <laughs> No, his evil is one of their gods or something. Yeah, uh, Stanley? What you say there, it means peace, mm -hmm. but it's kind of a return of the goes to show. Goes to show. Yep, exactly. So they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the uh, children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. I believe they're about 37 miles from where they started. That's how far they've moved. And by the way, I used to... Um, used to take my mother home when she was alive. She lived in Lakeland, Florida, to Flint, Michigan. I took her home so many years, I know exactly how far it was. 1,250 miles. Um, actually, I, I jumped the gun. I'll explain why that jumps out at me here in a minute. Uh, but hold that thought. Uh, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt, which means they've been out in the wilderness for a month now. How do we know that? First month on the 14th day was when they killed the Passover lamb. And they left that night. So basically you could say if it was after midnight, 
according to our time clock, that would have been the 15th. So if it was the 15th day of the first month when they left, it's the 15th day of the second month, been out in the wilderness for a month now. <clears throat> then the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Here we go again, the fourth time. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots full of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out, uh, brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, obviously, I don't think they even believe that, but it shows you just how frustrated they were but also how weak their faith is at this point. And I wrote Ecclesiastes 7.10 next to this verse. Any biblical scholars out there know what that passage is without looking at Ecclesiastes 7.10? I think we talked about it just last week, but it was recently I talked about it. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning them. Be careful when you start talking about the good old days. People love to talk about the good old days. And what's the problem with, I can think of two problems with lamenting about the good old days. First one is, were they really that good? Or are you just remembering the good parts about them? Because I think if you really, really, if, especially if you remember uh, the good old days, if you really think about it, it has many challenges and problems as today's world does. Um, yeah, there are some things I look back upon and uh, I wish, wish we could go back there again. I understand why we think that way, but we need to be careful of that because the good old days probably weren't as good as we remember them. Just as many troubles and trials and tribulations back then as we did now. Uh, but second point, which I think is more important, what's, what's the main problem with Always walking through life wishing it was the good old days. Thank you. I was going to sum it up with one word, gratitude. I, I'm a firm believer that as a Christian, you can find out how well you're doing it every second of every day. All you got to do is ask yourself one question. Am I grateful? I just saw a post today. Um, actually, the guy wants to come here and do a seminar. Um, but we've had a couple of visitors here recently, so I told him maybe in the fall. But, um, but anyways, his post was, um, let me get it close if not right, but he said, um, it's too bad we can't see how, or how little we need. Uh, we should be grateful for how, I'm not doing justice to the way it began, but you'll get the point. Um, if only we could see how little we need and how much we have. That was his quote, which I thought was pretty good. How little we need, but how much we have. And unfortunately, sometimes that will cause you to lose your gratitude. But we should be grateful at any given moment, no matter how tough and trying life can be. We should still be able to muster up gratitude. When I was a younger man, I didn't think you could be happy and sad at the same time. I didn't really understand that. If I was happy, I couldn't be sad. If I was sad, I couldn't be happy. And now I understand that. that's not true at all. I can be extremely frustrated and disappointed or whatever at what's going on around, and yet at the very same moment, still be grateful. Yeah, what was you going to say, Cindy? Right. Yeah. Well, it's a uh, great passage. Um, I hadn't thought of it in connection with this, but yeah. Um, you put your hand to the plow and then look back, what happens? Not worthy of the kingdom of God. Not worthy of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> but anyway, that's Proverbs, or excuse me, Ecclesiastes 7.10. Look at them lamenting about the good old days of slavery. Almost hard to believe that, but at least we were eating better. Um, but <clears throat> God's about to fix that for them, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. 
And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel at evening, You shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your murmuring is against the Lord. But what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your murmurings which you make against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Reminds me of Samuel when he was discouraged about Israel. Samuel, the last judge and first prophet. I think it's chapter 6, but it might be 8. I didn't look it up tonight, so I'm thinking off the top of my head. But um, when Israel said, give us a king like the nations around him, Samuel was upset. What did God say to Samuel? It's hard not to take it personal sometimes. You know? And Samuel took it personal, and God reminded him, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And it hurts sometimes when you know you're giving people the per pearl of great price, and they do not seem to want it. But anyways, <clears throat> they are rejecting God. Verse 9, Then Moses spoke to Aaron, saying to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your murmurings. Now as it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. You shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew laid all around the camp. That passage uh, is interesting for a few reasons. Number one, once again, skeptics who go in and look at this, guess what they say? Well, that can't be true because quail would never migrate this close to the coast at this time of year. Does anybody remember what time of the year it is? Abib. What did we say Abib is according to our calendar? Spring. Springtime, March and April. So if they've been at it a month, probably late April, closing in on May, something like that. Um, well, apparently the quail don't migrate this close to wherever Israel's camp um, that time of year. It might happen in the fall, but it wouldn't happen in the spring, according to them. But this is a miracle. So who cares? <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, <clears throat> I heard it said once, and you know, I don't really believe this, but I like the way it rings. No one's too dumb for the gospel, but some people are too smart for it. People are just a little too clever for the gospel. Um, but in light of this passage, um, notice something else. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 13 for a minute. I had heard something in school, and I would have never thought to make connection with it tonight, but I just read it about five days ago, so it's kind of on my mind, and I'll explain what I mean here in a minute. Look at Deuteronomy 13. <clears throat> Verse 1. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing, you know, uh, is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet, 
Now that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk so you shall put away the evil from your midst. So what gets my attention mostly about that passage is notice this prophet has actually said something that came true. Now what's that got to do with anything that we're studying? And why does Mike mention he knows how long it is from Lakeland, Florida to Flint, Michigan? It's 1,250 miles. I know it because it did it year after year. You might know how far it is from Nauvoo, Illinois to Salt Lake City? 1,300 miles. I couldn't even imagine walking from Lakeland, Florida, Flint, Michigan. Okay, it's time to go get my, start walking. <laughs> I can't imagine living that way. Anybody know how the Mormons got out to Salt Lake City? Anybody ever heard of the handcart tragedy? One of the most disgusting things in all of history. I can't believe it happened. When the Mormons first began to migrate to uh, Salt Lake City, they covered wagons with uh, two oxen. I think they had two oxen on each one, had a donkey. You know, and wagons stuffed with um, provisions. <clears throat> well, guess what happened to the guy that, um, he wasn't Brigham Young, but it was one of his financiers, if you will. Guy went $20,000 in debt getting people out there. Because two oxen and a horse or whatever it is that they carried with them, and I forget all the animals and supplies that they had, it cost a lot of money. So after they got the first two migrations out there, guess what Brigham Young said? We're spending too much money on them. Do you know how they, you know what they did to get out to Salt Lake City? Put all their belongings in a handcart. And walk 1,300 miles like this. Two wheels. Two wheels. Half of them died along the way. It was you know, one of the greatest tragedies. The reason you don't, most people don't know about it, Charles does, because you, know, you got to go looking for information like that. You don't hear about it just naturally if you go looking for it. But anyways, that's just kind of interesting, you know, and I, I would tell you about that. But the reason why I even brought him up is and I just read this like five days ago. I remember hearing about it when I was in school. But apparently, on their track out there, one of the migrations on their track out there uh, lost all their provisions or about starving to death, and guess what happened? It's well attested. Bunch of quail came in, fell right in the camp. What do you think Mormons thought? Hallelujah! It's a sign God is with us. They tell that story. If you, have, you, know, if you know a Mormon, ask him about it. I'll, I'll bet you he knows about it. But they tell that story like it was a sign from God that he's with us, which is why we read Deuteronomy chapter 13, because occasionally God does allow. And remember in the New Testament, even um, the working of Satan comes with all power, signs, and lying wonders. What does that mean? Now, speaking of Haiti, back when uh, I was in school, Jackie said, do you know what uh, voodoo practitioners were doing in Haiti? They had some drug that if they, you took it, your body would slow down to the point where you couldn't detect a heartbeat. A couple days later, the drug wears off and you get back up. What do you think they're doing with that? Claim they're raising people from the dead. Well, hey, if you saw it, you know, a doctor's got the stethoscope out there, he hasn't moved in six hours, and the doctor pronounces him dead. Three days later, there he is walking around. You think somebody would believe he got raised from the dead? In this world, you better know. Point being that even if you see something you know, marvelous and wonderful, you still got to measure it by the Bible every time. And by the way, I'll, I'll say this. I think sometimes we take the age of miracles a little too far. And what I mean is, there's no such thing as a faith healer. Anybody claims he's got a, the God-given ability to heal, I already know he's a false teacher. But does that mean that there's no such thing as miraculous healing? 
Because I know a lot of people kind of almost conclude that that's what it means. And the reason why I say this is because, again, same book. No, actually, it was a different book I was reading. A uh, member of the Restoration Movement was in a camp with the Mormons when he claimed somebody that was deathly ill got up immediately after they prayed for him. And, I mean, the way he wrote it was like he was an eyewitness and he believed what happened. And the point being that I'm not entirely sure that those kinds of things, I'm positive that no one can do that. There's nobody on the planet that says, let me put my hands on you and God will heal you. That can't happen. But, you know, you ever notice how when we pray for somebody who's sick, we say things like, uh, guide the hands of the doctors? Well, I don't have any problem with that, so I'm not arguing. So if you say that, don't think I'm mad at you. But you know what I'd rather pray? Why don't you go ahead and heal them before you have to go to the hospital? I got kidney stones once. You know what I prayed? Take them away right now, God. <laughs> I don't want to go and get them taken out the way they take them out. Go ahead and relieve me of them right now. Can he do it? Of course he can. Will he do it? That's another matter. The reason why I say that is because I'm not sure I want to dismiss everything people tell me that they swear they saw happen. I used to get my hair cut when I lived in Gainesville by a guy that was Pentecostal. And he swears up and down that he got healed at a tent meeting. Well, how am I going to argue with it? The guy was sincere and genuine to me. He was a nice enough guy. But, you know, I'm not going to deny that you got healed at a tent meeting 10 years ago. I wasn't there. And I'm not entirely sure it's not true. I know the preacher at the tent meeting didn't put his hands on you and God worked through him that way because prophecy, speaking in tongues, the miraculous age in that sense is over, but the power of God is not over. And so I think we need to be careful with that. But yeah, the uh, Mormons have a well-attested history about quail coming and landing in their camp and saving them. So, And the reason why I'm pointing that out to you is in case you ever do have a Bible study with a Mormon, uh, that may come up because they are quite proud of that historical moment. Yeah, Charles? Well, one of the points that I understand is that I know God continues to provide manna until they reach Canaan or the promised land. Uh, I'm assuming from this that he provided the quail until uh, for 40 years. So it came out there. Yeah. yeah. So is, is it, would it be correct to say that in addition to the manna, that he was also providing quail during the, uh, their journey in the wilderness? Uh, I had not thought that before, Charles. I thought this was a one-time event plus that other one. Well, but. <laughs> Yeah, I. I Well, before I answered your question, I was going to read Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, which says this. So the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. And verse 12 reads this way. Now the manna ceased on the day after the children had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate food of the land of Canaan that year. So I was wanting to read that before I answered your question, Charles, just to see if quail was mentioned. And of course, obviously, it's just mentioning the manna. So my initial answer without, you know, 
being uh, absolutely positive would be no, there was just two incidents there with the quail. That's what I've always believed. That's what I think is the answer, but I'm not sure. I was going to save it till the end of the chapter, but since Charles brought it up, a couple of facts for you. Uh, and Omer is, where did I got it written here? Give me a minute. Omer is basically six and a half pints. And scholars believe uh, the reason why they gave the Omer is because by the time the Jews, um, um, or the Jews probably didn't know what an Omer was. That's like telling me it was six meters. Okay, now tell it to me and something I understand, would you? <laughs> So that's probably why they tell you what an omer is. But an omer translates to six and a half pints a day of food, manna, if you will, which is actually more than a person needs, but I think it's kind of like uh, Asian food. Um, man, they bring you an awful lot when you're eating, don't they? Every Asian restaurant I've ever been to, just loaded, place loaded. But what happens two hours later? Yeah, I'm hungry again. <laughs> It doesn't last very long. Well, I think manna was kind of the same way. You could overeat, so to speak, but it was light. It wasn't heavy on your system. Anybody know what manna means? What, what the word actually means, manna? What is it? What is it? That's what it means. What is it? Um, there is a psalm, Betty, that calls it cornmeal or something. There's another psalm. It's uh, Psalm 78:25 calls it angel food. Bread from heaven. And Charles, just to finish off the, the point you just made, anybody want to take a guess at how much pounds of manna Israel picked up every day? I just heard that week. Did you? Nine million pounds. Nine million pounds of manna every day. God laid out there. Uh, anyways. <clears throat> In what way? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Uh, so let's go ahead and finish up the chapter. Uh, verse 14. When the layer dew lifted there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? There you go, that's manna right there. What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This very thing which, came, uh, which the Lord has commanded, let every man gather it according to each one's need, one omer for each person. According to the number of persons, let every man take for those who are of his tent. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less, depending on how big the family was. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. Reminds me of that same story, buddy. Can you imagine? You, you know how much food got put in the basket, but why is there always another piece? <laughs> when are we going to run? Sure, it's going to run out before it gets to me. Nope, it's not going to run out at all. But that one, that's kind of an interesting passage because I'm not sure how to read that, quite frankly, for this reason. Because it almost sounds like you couldn't pick up too much or too little. But then the rest of the chapter shows us that that's exactly what was happening. They were trying to pick up too much. So I'm not exactly sure how to read that passage. Um, and neither did Wilbur. And if I get any insight into it, I'll... Just an honest mistake kind of thing. That might be the answer right there, Charles. That's good insight. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Ben. That's why I said it's a difficult verse to understand.
the difference between an accident and actually trying to game the system. I think that's what Charles is saying. Is that right? Well, you know, if you were supposed to go out in the yard and pick up 10 pounds worth, if you didn't have a scale, would you know how much 10 pounds is? Yeah, it would take a little bit, though. And that might be the answer, Charles, but that's what makes that passage kind of difficult to read is... Yeah. Once you've done it a thousand times, yeah. Yeah, that's a few days, but you know what's going on. Well, there is, it's kind of an offer, I guess, to make a similar illustration uh, in Acts when they were collecting the money and uh, her name just went over my head. But Quill and Priscilla? Who sold the property. A Quill and Priscilla? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. Mention Bobby. <laughs> and a sense of fire. We're right about this one. Uh, but they, uh, you know, uh, they held back part of the money. Right. Yeah. That was an of sense of fire. And, you know, Peter says, you know, you've not lied uh, to men, but you've lied to God. Well, God knew that, so, you know, it was an example of greed to some degree that they wanted to look good. Well, and the law of Moses goes on to talk about sinning with a high hand. And I think that's kind of the difference, is there's such a thing as an accident. There's such a thing as I didn't pick up enough for my family. I should have picked up more. God provided, and then there's somebody, ah, maybe I picked up a little too much. And God took care of that. But it was the people that, I don't care what God said, I'm getting twice as much. That, that didn't fly, yeah, sin. Good point. Good point. Well, when Christ fed the, uh, the 5,000, you know, with, or 4,000 with, what, two fish and loaves, uh, everybody ate until they had enough. Of course, in that case, there was some left over, but uh, anyway. I, yeah, I always wanted to be there in that scene, hear how many people are whining. Well, it's only going to feed seven people. Oh, wait a minute. Well, that, that <laughs> I never, yeah, I never heard that. Well, we are running a little bit late, even though we didn't get done with the chapter, but I know most of us know what's in the chapter. Um, so we'll pick it up there next week. But again, picked up nine million, what's that? I guess we'll get to the Sabbath next week. Which is interesting because the Sabbath has not been given yet. Yeah. And so Sabbath Day Adventists kind of make a big deal about this. But we'll have to pick that up next week. We'll pick it up uh, about verse 19 next week. Exodus 16, 19, for those of you who are studying at home, we'll pick it up right there next week. Notice a couple of things about that. Anyways, we certainly appreciate you coming on out. We have anything going on this weekend? What is it? Um, this should be song service Sunday. Stanley, you ready to sing some songs on Sunday? Isn't it? Oh, yeah, you're right.
I don't know why I was thinking it was another weekend in June. Thank you. I thought you were just trying to get out of it. Uh, for some reason, I was thinking there's still another weekend left in uh, June. There is not. What is Sunday? The second? Yeah, my birthday's on Saturday. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, anyways, this Sunday, when are we having a meal in the month of July? Have we figured that out yet? Yeah. All these special days, we keep messing it up. We're not, I, I'm assuming, are we? Yeah. Uh, Cookout's kind of in place of the meal? Oh, I'm not arguing. I'm saying, yeah. I didn't expect we would have a meal on Sunday. Yeah. So we're just, the cookout will be kind of our fellowship meal, and then in August we'll pick it back up at first until sometime late in July when we decide to change it. <laughs> no. Anyways. Um, yeah, no, co no uh, fellowship meal this Sunday. We just had it last Sunday. And by the way, making jokes about it, appreciate you letting us do it that way. We were really hoping that we could get somebody here, and that was the only time they could come, and we wanted to have a meal. So thank you for letting us move it. We appreciate it. But, yeah, I, th I thought so too. But all things considered, we'll pick up our fellowship meal on August, first Sunday in August. Uh, please keep David in your prayers, although Eddie did mention him. But um, Eddie, thank you for patting Mike on the back, too. Don't forget to keep Mike in your prayers. He's certainly got a lot on his plate with all his family that is sick as they are. Uh, and he's got a full-time job. So keep Solomon's family in your prayer, but particularly David. does not sound like he's doing very well in the hospital. So, Well, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Yes. Blessings in a book bag. We're already uh, fired up and ready for that. We'll put them together in July. Is that what you're saying? So if you want to give some money, uh, Michelle or Betty, Michelle or Betty, um, we'll take your money and then we'll be putting them together in July. When does school start? Anybody know? Third. It was a, yeah, it was, yeah, it was after Labor Day. It's supposed to be after Labor Day. All right, let's have a prayer. Thank you, Father in Heaven, for this hour that we could spend together. Thank you for blessing our uh, event last weekend. We pray, Father, that those who came that do not regularly come, uh, perhaps, Father, they were inspired and will want to come back. But, of course, Father, <clears throat> we do these kinds of things because we do care about the souls of our neighbors. And we pray, Father, that, that uh, something good will happen. We pray that you open doors of opportunity, Father. Help us to find people who are hungry. They may not know what they're looking for, but they're looking. And help us to find them, Father, so that we can teach them your son's ever-loving gospel. We thank you for this hour, Father. We're mindful again of the Solomons, and particularly David uh, at this time. But please be with the entire family. Strengthen Mike. Uh, for all that he has to do, be with Deborah, be with Nancy, uh, be with Holly, be with uh, Dale, and be with Ken as well, Father. Thank you for this hour. Grant us wisdom, grant us peace, grant us unity. And as always, grant us these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you for tuning in online. We will see you, God willing, on Sunday. Hey, Chabella.